In our very first story, the world's first vaccine against malaria will become available in Ghana and two other African countries, Kenya and Malawi, from next year. The RTSS vaccine trains the immune system to attack the malaria parasite, which is spread by mosquito bites. The World Health Organization says the jab has the potential to save tens of thousands of lives. Deputy Health Minister Kingsley Jedu made the announcement at the launch of World Malaria Day on Monday. Han Hanodame has more in this report. Ghana has made significant strides in the fight against malaria from a prevalence rate of 20% in 2009 to 4.4% in 2016. The program seeks to reduce the rate even further by 2020. Thus, the theme for this year's World Malaria Day and Malaria for Good. Program manager of the National Malaria Control Program, Dr. Constance Bart Planch, was excited that the interventions put in place over the years has yielded positive results visible on the African continent. We've made all this progress. Does it mean it's been smooth sailing? No. There have been challenges and there are still challenges. The challenge is still to do with the resistance and the use of the nets. Even though we've shown and everywhere, the whole world shows that if you use the nets, malaria can really be, pro uh, you can be prevented from getting malaria. Still, there are people who do not want to use it. We have a pain, and the pain is the attitude on the use of the nets. People bring in the nets, donors, governments, to support the country. If you will not sleep in the net, please give it to somebody who is sleep, who will sleep in it. The other challenge we have is the irrational use of grass. You think you have malaria, you are buying the medicine. The medicines also, you know, have side effects. Make sure you have malaria. Test, please, before you treat. There are only two regions in Ghana now that we can say are truly hyper-endemic. So the question to ask all is, are we on the path for pre-elimination and elimination? Deputy Health Minister Kingsley Jedu announced as a way of sustaining this achievement, Ghana will join Kenya and Malawi to partake in the WHO coordinated malaria vaccine implementation program. I'm happy to announce that another effective method for tackling the disease is about to be rolled out in Ghana. This is the malaria vaccine. Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi, sorry, have been selected to take part in WHO coordinated pilot program that will make the world's first malaria vaccine available in selected areas beginning in 2018. This vaccine, RTSS, has gone through more than 20 years of testing, and Ghana has played a major role in its development. The malaria vaccine pilot program will assess whether the vaccine's protective effect in children 5 months to 17 months old can be scaled up in reducing childhood deaths and its safety in the context of routine use. For Joy News, my name is Hannah Odame. First Lady Rebecca Kufuado has meanwhile tasked corporate institutions to support the fight against malaria, giving the keynote address at the launch of the National Malaria Foundation in Accra on Monday. The First Lady noted, though Ghana has been put on the high pedestal in Africa for effectively fighting malaria, the gains can be eroded, resulting in a resurgence if the funding gap is not bridged, especially as donor funds dwindle. She launched the foundation with an aim of generating support and financial assistance to enable Ghana meet its target of reducing malaria to zero by zero percent by 2020. Well, moving on to other stories, and uh, government and the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources is expected to invest not less than $10 million at the initial stage of the multilateral mining integrated program. According to the Minister John Peter May, with a five year MMIP, will ensure that all abandoned mining pits are reclaimed in the process. He says the program is expected to create jobs for the unlicensed miners who would be re engaged after the ongoing clampdown on illegal mining. 
Now we have five projects which we call the multilateral integrated project. This project applies technology enforcement and law. What the project is going to do is to get this same factory hands who were you know, previously engaged in this activity okay. together to come and work in an area that has already been explored, an area that is determined to be prospective. Uh, we're going to put in a central processing plant for them where the mine and the oil they get from the mining will be passed through the processing plant and it will be for a fee. You tow your oil for a fee. There is going to be a supervision and so that they do not go just mining, you know, as we are saying, digging everywhere in them to see if they will locate gold. The five years because we need some capital to get involved in it. And that is why it's, uh, when it gets established, well established, I mean, we don't have any problem. How it, much capital do we need in the MMIP? Well, it's quite uh, extensive now. We, we, we're looking at a margin of no less than about $10 million, you know, to not to start, but when it gets to the peak. I mean, so um, it's, it's a way forward, yeah. Now, two Ghanaians suspected to have killed a Chinese engineer have been arrested by the Bachelor Divisional Police Command. Ren Guanfa was found dead in his room on April 13. The suspects, Ekor Kosa, 23, and Michael Manson, 22, both workers of the deceased, were arrested upon a tip-off. A search at their respective residences revealed a Huawei P8 smartphone, Lenovo desktop computer, as well as a bag containing personal belongings of the deceased. The suspects admitted to committing the crime upon interrogation. Chief Superintendent Felix K. Cosmos explains the basis for the arrest. Investigations have established that the two suspects went to the residence of the deceased under the guise or the pretext of going to fetch water from the reservoir that the deceased had in his residence. Diseased opened his door when it was knocked at, only to be pounced on, upon by the two suspects. They subjected him to intensive beatings with their fists and sticks and eventually strangulated him to death. After he had died, suspect Munko used a knife to cut the left wrist of the deceased. Thereafter, they ransacked the room and stole two mobile phones, the desktop computers, and then the personal effects of the deceased person. Meanwhile, the body of the deceased had been preserved at the police hospital mortuary pending autopsy. And the suspects are meanwhile being processed and arraigned before the court. Chief Superintendent Felix Costa was assured the public of police's, com of police's commitment and determination to fight crime and appeal to the public to volunteer information to assist in cracking down on criminal activities. The police wishes to affirm its commitment and determination in the fight against crime, especially armed robbery, so that law-abiding citizens will feel safe and secured. To the criminals or to the criminal-minded people or persons within the jurisdiction, we wish to caution you to refrain from such acts, else the law will catch up with you and deal with you according to the laws of the land. Also, five Chinese nationals standing trial for mining in the Ankobra River were denied bail again on Monday when they appeared before a second year court. They have subsequently been remanded into prison custody. Francis Waja was in court for Joy News and joins me now with details. Hello, Francis. Tell us what transpired in court today. Okay, Israel. So um, the first Chinese and their five Ghanaian counterparts were again denied bail um, today. Um, the defense counsel, um, for the second time, made the case that um, these guys are 
as residents in Ghana. And again, the five Ghanaians are citizens of the land. And so um, in his wisdom, they will not interfere with um, the investigation. But um, the judge in his wisdom uh, denied them bail in the first instance, and then today as well also denied them bail. But interesting to note is that rather um, they were remanded into prison custody. Earlier, they had been remanded into police custody. And today is the 24th of April, which means it's exactly one month when these individuals were arrested. They were arrested on the 24th of March for mining on the Angkodra River. Now, um, two weeks ago when the case was adjourned to today, uh, the major reason was the fact that there was a lack of a certified Chinese interpreter who would do the interpretation to the court. Fortunately, today, there was one interpreter who came all the way from Accra to Dakar in the new court um, three. He did the interpretation for them, but um, the, the, the defense counsel could not get his wish to, um, to get a deal for his friend, Israel. All right, thank you very much, uh, Francis Waja, bringing us up to speed uh, with the latest of so the case of the five Chinese nationals who were brought before court today. We're taking a break on Joy News Prime. We'll be back with more. Please don't go away. Now, Accra is currently struggling with waste management of the city's waste, open defecation and dumping of fecal matter directly into the city despite the establishment of a new liquid waste treatment plant. This notwithstanding, President Okufado has set for himself the Herculean task of making Accra the cleanest city in Africa by the end of his first term. So just how bad is the situation at the moment and what work will this entail? Maxwell Agbagba has more. Barely 48 hours ago, President Akufuado made some bold declarations that he's going to make Accra one of the cleanest cities in Africa. Even before the president sets out on what many have described as an ambitious project, we are out and about in it of Accra to see for ourselves what exactly the situation is like. Right here in the middle of the graphic road, this is what we see. Some household refuse and refuse also from some offices around. This is the state of Accra. Uh, rubbish around this area is not good. Mm. But we are different people and we come from different houses. Mm. So for me, it will be better for the government to produce enough dustbin for us to put the rubbish inside mm. so that the area too can be green for those of, the, those of us who live in this environment. Mm. So you think because the dustbins are not enough, that's why people are dumping here? Yeah, that is a major problem because the dustbins are not plenty within this community. That is why, and most of the times, too, it is within we, the people who live in the community. Okay. We intentionally did something which is not good so that we can use that one against the government to say maybe the government is not doing he or his work proper, properly. Mm. Yeah, so me, it will be better for the AMA always people to go around to check if um, there is something which is going on in the community which is not good. I think Maybe, for instance, in our village like this, we have something called a uh, saman saman. Mm. Yeah, they can come around. I mean, if there is something rubbish around some place, which is not good, the company behind it or the committee that the rubbish has been mm. kept for, they can arrest those people behind that place so that some of us too can use that thing as a lesson mm. so that the, we can keep Ghana clean. It's a different location. We're here at the Kandeshi Market, and the situation here mirrors what is across a lot of markets here in Accra. In fact, when you come here, there are all sort of items on display, ranging from tomatoes, fish, pepper, okra, whatever that you can think of is on sale here. But right here in the central part of the market is this refuse, huge refuse. The president can do a lot by providing dozens to get some situations like this. But can he change the attitude of the people in this market? From our backyard, but the way I come down to this case here and saw the refuse here, mm. it's very bad. I don't know what is happening in our management. Mm. We have a law abiding for health and everything. Why is this going on in the country? Mm. Please, the government should come down and do something about it. Thank you. The stench is very worrying. I'm sure people come here to buy tomatoes and all of that to go and cook and sell to the general public. What do you think about the health aspect? Also? That's what I'm saying. There is a law abiding health and everything. Mm. And look at the inhaling of this such a smelling uh, order. Mm. So please, the government should come and do immediate something about this. Mm. 
Now, Maxwell Agbagba put together that report. Now, two companies owned by Ibrahim Mahama have until the middle of May to pay over 10 million CDs in import duties or risk a range of sanctions by the Ghana Revenue Authority. The ultimatum from the GRA is the latest in the saga of the tax obligations of the former president's brother, which has had him being hauled before the Economic and Organized Crime of Crimes Office. He is said to have failed to pay import duties on heavy equipment he imported in 2015. Jerry officials still join news. The authority was compelled to renege on an earlier agreement to have Mr. Mahama settle it in monthly installments until December next year after some of the post-data checks he issued were drawn on bank accounts that had been closed. Raymond Aqua has more. A heavy-duty equipment dealer, MBG Limited, and Holman Brothers, both owned by Ibrahim Mahama, brother of the former president, John Mahama, owed the GRA colossal amount of money in import duties, according to GRA Assistant Commissioner for Communication, Robert Mensah. MBG Limited owed 13.15 million cities in duties as of December 2016, which was supposed to have been paid up by November 2015. The other company, Holman Brothers, owed as of December 2015 an amount of 3.71 million cities. Realizing that getting the two companies to settle their outstanding debt was becoming a problem, the GRA, the assistant commissioner said, entered into a settlement arrangement with the companies. Under the arrangement, MBG Limited was supposed to make a monthly payment of 800,000 cities from December 2016 to December 2017. The second company, Mr. Mensa said, was also to pay 192,000 cities monthly for 13 months to clear its indebtedness. But the two companies defaulted, compelling the GRA to scrap the arrangement and demand full settlement of the indebtedness with interest, which has been outstanding since 2015. Ibrahim Mahama now has two weeks to settle this debt or risk the auctioning of the imports to defray the debt. While having uh, reneged on at least two occasions, we want to go into that. We need a revenue. Okay. So we will have to now go into other instruments or controls within our system. One, to detain the goods involved. But the goods are in his possession, not in your possession. Oh, we can go after the goods anywhere they are. The other, you can uh, track them? We can track them. The other fortune lists are not goods that you can easily risk away to another place. Anti-graft agency, the Economic and Organized Crime Office, last week interrogated Mr. Mahama over that checks issued for the payment of import duties to GRA. The GRA Assistant Commissioner for Communications says he couldn't comment on Yoko's investigation since the authority did not instigate them. He, however, confirmed that checks issued to GRA as part of payment for the company's debt were returned. I can confirm that number of 44 checks. How but many do you know as GRA? I can't, uh, I can't give you that figure. I don't have that information on hand. Okay, so if it's unclear the number of checks issued, what was the response from these banks when the checks were sent to the banks? No, they were... We uh, present it, so they will turn to us that you, these your checks were not honored. Was it because there were no monies in the account or the account no. were not existing? In fact, they brought them back with a, a note or an advice that those uh, accounts have been closed. So you issued checks to accounts which were closed? Exactly. There are media reports the former head of the GRA, Mr. George Blankson, was invited Monday morning by Yoko to assist in investigations into the issue of the dirt checks. I'm joined in the studio by Araba Kum Singh, who has been following up on this matter. Uh, good evening, and thank you for joining us, uh, Araba. Good we, to be here, we, Israel. Yeah, Always good to see you. <laughs> we understand that Ibrahim Mahama was expected to come before you could today. Tell us what you found out. Well, uh, as you know, Mr. Uh, Ibrahim Mahama has been appearing before Yoko uh, twice last week. Um, the first being Tuesday and then last week, Friday. We also made to understand that some custom officials, uh, customs officials uh, of the officials of the GRA, the customs division, were also expected to make an appearance, uh, you know, and they were to be queried 
on um, why it breached its standards purportedly in the matter involving Mr. Ibrahim Mahama. We can't confirm whether Mr. Ibrahim Mahama was present today at Iyoko uh, or whether the customs officials were also queried today because um, Iyoko officials were tight-lipped on the matter. What we can report is that there was heavy police presence at the Iyoko office. You know, Iyoko shares a, a wall with a Shraj. And so we were speaking to some officials of Shraj who said that um, this was the first time they had seen the police being dispatched there. But upon further interrogation, we, we learned that uh, um, the police were sent there to avert uh, any possible outbreak of violence should uh, members of the NDC or supporters of Mr. Ibrahim Mahama mass up to the place. Because as you know, they believe that this is a witch hunt against former government officials. All right. So we also know that the GRE has given Mr. Ibrahim Mahama two weeks to settle the outstanding obligations. Uh, first of all, do we know what these uh, or risk the, these imported items being seized? And, and so do you know the items involved? Well, it's not clear. But what we are being made to understand, again, per our sources, uh, is that they are heavy duty machines and equipment and vehicles which are used for road construction. And because he was supposedly using these uh, machines for a government project, the road project he was working on, one thing my source tells me is that usually when foreign firms uh, are given or take up such government contracts, the tax on their imported equipment is usually waived. But this was not the case for Mr. Ibrahim Mahama. No special consideration was given to him. But be that as it may, he came to that arrangement with the GRA officials to stagger the payment of the duties. All right. So what, well, what I know about um, you know, these waivers that you're talking about is that you apply for them. And if you apply for them, uh, you should be giving if they find that. Uh, and that's you, another you question people are asking. Did he apply or did he not apply? And if he applied, being the president's brother, I don't think that anybody would, re would deny him that. But we also know that he has uh, 14 days to pay up or have these equipment seized. Having spoken to people close to him, how do they feel about this ultimatum? Well, uh, my source tells me that Iyoko is on, quote, a, a fishing expedition. And so really they don't expect anything to come out of this. But one option that they're considering is calling the bluff of GRE because as far as they are concerned, a bounce check does not constitute fraud uh, as they were issued with uh, no intent uh, or with intent to f defraud. So I'm informed government owes Ibrahim Mahama 25 million CDs and he had told Iyoko and the GRE officials that you know, he was relying on government to pay him so that he'll be paying those duties he owes the GRE. All right, thank you very much, uh, Arabah Kum Singh. Sure. Arabah Kum Singh is an editor here at Joy News. Now, government is planning to transform state-owned media houses into financially independent and self-sustained institutions. Minister for Information Mustafa Hamid said the M says the MPP's philosophy of the state not taking charge of the media informed the administration's decision to rather build the capacity of state-owned media houses that would operate without interference from government. He made this known at a press briefing in the Volta Regional Capital Hall at a two-day executive retreat for key agencies under the Information Ministry. According to the minister, output of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, GBC, does not match with the amount of finances injected into the state's broadcaster by government. He reiterated that the introduction of an innovative way of collecting TV licenses would help the state broadcaster be more financially independent. Our goal ultimately is to build the capacities of these um, so-called state-owned media to be completely financially independent and self-sustaining so that government is not even putting money in GBC, for example. Right now, government is putting a lot of money in GBC. And even so, as you said, we, we are not getting the right kind of output. Okay, but if we build GBC to a point where we can divest it completely of state intervention, then it will be truly independent, not just to serve the citizens of Ghana, but to hold governments truly accountable.
He disclosed that the Information Ministry has resolved to reconsider the mandate of a Ghana news agency to ensure it conforms with the new trend of media around the world. He added that the State of the Nation address and key highlights of a 2017 budget would be translated into Ghanaian languages and made available to the citizenry within the shortest possible time. Mr. Hamid also assured that his ministry would ensure the right to information bill is passed before the end of 2017. What, what it is is that the right to information bill was in parliament last year. Unfortunately, it wasn't passed before the end of the year. And then the mandate of the last parliament lapsed. Now, the rule, therefore, is that because this is a completely new parliament, we have to relay the bill. And therefore, we took it out. The attorney general, uh, the attorney general's department, I must say, is looking at it again with a view to giving it fresh impetus. And then it will go back to this cabinet. Of course, the cabinet that approved it for that parliament is not also this cabinet. So this cabinet would also look at it again and then pass it on to our parliament. The information minister was accompanied by his three deputies, Kojo Upon Nkrumah, Amat Dokwa Isiyama Ijei, and Perry Okujeto. Fred Kwame Asari's report for Joy News. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Business on the News. Finance Minister Kenopo Riata is rejecting suggestions of pushing hard to end the IMF program in April next year because of borrowing restrictions. The minister earlier this month disclosed that the government is working hard to implement all the necessary reforms to aid program completion come April 2018. However, some analysts argued that the government may not be able to meet all the targets looking at the time left to complete the program. They have maintained that government just wants to quickly get out of the program so it can borrow to finance most of its campaign promises. But Finance Minister Kenufo Riata disagrees. We are, we are truly committed to end in, in April 2018. And um, we we'll, you know, but, but I think maybe something that we should we should be clear on <clears throat> with regards to the fund um, is that there are two there are two or three components to it. One certainly you get into a program of the Article Four of the reviews, which then releases money to you, and you do certain things to support your budget. Uh, there's also you know a very um, strong um, technical. Um, assistant component um, of the fund, uh, which is what um, creates the, um, the institutional mechanism to ensure that the discipline continues. And I think those are things that uh, we will be taking advantage of and therefore working with the fund, uh, but maybe in a different way. Do you, think, do you think that the restrictions are too much? That is why it's motivating other members in government to say that let's quickly get ready and get out of this program in April because even without a program we are raising or even without direct supervision of the fund or even support, we are able to secure $2.2 .2 billion. Maybe the market confidence that was a problem we have already achieved it but the issue uh, really George I, I think we, we get it completely wrong I mean the, the issue that we have to contend with is as Ghanaians whether the fund was there or not um, with a 70 percent um, debt to GDP ratio um, with all of the fiscal indiscipline we'll have to do those things ourselves and that is really the fundamental thing whether the fund is in or the fund is not in so the argument um, about well we've got money getting money does not mean that we're going to use it uh, you know in an indisciplined way um, the key thing is whether the fund is with us or not we would have to have done um, these very difficult measures that we are taking Meanwhile, the IMF has confirmed it is still discussing with government a possible extension of the fund program. Finance Minister Ken Furiata has a recent engagement said this decision will not come easy for the economy. Some lead analysts have concluded that Ghana may not request for a program extension despite the expected difficulties that may come along with completing the program as scheduled. But in response to a question posed by Joy Business's George Riafi at the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings in Washington, D.C., Head of Africa Department of the IMF, Abebe Ameru Selassie, said the extension of the program would be based on conclusion of current discussions with government. Now, um, 
should the program be extended? I mean, ultimately, this is something that's up to the government. Um, from uh, our side, of course, as you noted, the arrangement uh, has one more year to run. Uh, the program is facing uh, some headwinds. Uh, in particular, there was a big, uh, significant fiscal slippage uh, last year relative to the targets. So um, to get to the program, as you noted, there would have to be a fairly, uh, fairly uh, uh, significant, you know, fairly uh, forceful significant adjustment over the coming year. You know, so uh, what is important, though, is not just the amount of fiscal adjustment that has to be done, but also the government's ability to restore confidence uh, by pursuing um, and addressing uh, the structural reforms that uh, the economy needs. Here, I would I want to highlight in particular kind of there's quite a bit of reforms that need to be done in the in the state-owned enterprise sector, which have been a source of uh, a source of uh, a source of pressure uh, on the public accounts uh, uh, and impacting the banking system also. So I think tackling those would also be uh, very important in the coming uh, months. But you know, ultimately, uh, I think the government has asked for time um, and their considering uh, how best to move forward uh, with the program uh, th that the country has with us. And, you know, we're happy for the government to uh, finish its deliberations. And uh, we, you know, we've already had one mission there uh, also initiating the Article 4 discussions. So uh, we're in discussions and uh, we'll let you know uh, as soon as uh, a decision has been taken by the government. Away from the spring meetings in Washington, D.C., a team of German investors is currently in the country to explore business opportunities in the agricultural sector. Led by the German ambassador to Ghana, His Excellency Christoph Retzlaff, the team has met with the business development minister, Ibrahim Mohamed Awal. The German ambassador, on behalf of the investors, promised to generate many jobs through the agri sector. Here's more in this report. The 10-member delegation led by the German ambassador to Ghana, Christoph Retzlaff, is hoping to invest heavily in the agri sector through the use of technology. The German ambassador says the choice of Ghana was because the Ghana government has resolved to create an enabling environment for the private sector to thrive. Today, the purpose of this visit is to get acquainted with the chances and the possibilities of doing business um, with Ghana. Um, the delegation is here to learn from you, from your colleagues, you know, what are the chances, what can we do to strengthen. And I must say that North Rhine-Westphalia has already a very deep cooperation uh, with your country. There's a cooperation agreement that has been signed uh, some years ago. We had the Minister for Europe of the state of North Rhine-Westphalia being here last year, I think it was in May or something. So this, there is already a strong cooperation between Ghana and North Rhine-Westphalia, and we hope to further increase this cooperation. Speaking to Joy Business, Minister of Business Development Mohamed Awar revealed that government will use a partnership with the German government to improve the cost of doing business in Ghana. He said the Business Development Ministry will carefully monitor negotiations with the delegation to ensure value for money. I've seen investors from Germany who have realized that Ghana government is ready to do business. They've listened to our president's pronouncements. They've seen the president's uh, um, trips around encouraging investors. So I think they've, they've seen that this government is ready to do business and they therefore want to partner this government to improve the business environment in this country. That's what I see. I think the government has priority areas, and we, are, we, have, we do due diligence. We don't just get out and say, one, we don't want investment for investment's sake. One investment that will come and support our people in terms of technology transfer, they will also protect the environment, make sure that they also go by the rules and regulations of this country. The German investors are expected to expand Ghana's agri sector with emphasis on post-harvest losses in the country. Magana's hospitality industry is to witness a new boost as the Upper West Regional Capital WA will soon see the completion of one of the biggest hotels in the southern belt of the country. The project is expected to generate employment to the teeming youth as well as improve the social lives of the people in one of the poorest regions in the country. Rafik Salam reports from Drapa. The multi-million dollar project is lying on a 62.5 acre land on the Jirapa Tompoy Road. Its real name is Louisville Hotel, but now rechristened as Upper West or Greba Dubai. The first phase of the project, which comprises of an executive mansion, a helipad, 182 beds, zoo, 
indoor and outdoor swimming pools, restaurants, water bottling plant is scheduled to be commissioned in August this year. The executive mansion is already completed ahead of the August opening date and fixed with the state-of-the-art equipment for the comfort of its guests. It is a two-story facility that has several living and conference rooms for meetings. It has steam and jacuzzi baths with television sets, a helipad for landing of helicopters for emergency cases has been provided in front of the executive mansion and to cater for the needs of high-class customers who will want to avoid the distance by road. There is also a 24-hour restaurant, seven various varieties of dishes, and a zoo with animals such as antelope, chimpanzee, monkey, and grass cutters, among others, to give their customers a touch of sightseeing. Project engineer for Intermec Ghana Limited, Michael Kuloge, who conducted a media around the facility, disclosed that Louisville Hotel Project also has a water factory that will produce 3,000 cartons of bottled water per day, a swimming pool at different locations, and customers are assured of adequate and quality water supply. Our bowls, okay, are giving us a combined yield of one million liters in a day. It means that we can draw one million liters of water from the bowls every day, and we are still okay. The bowls are ready to give us another million the next day. That is what we are getting. Now, our consumption in terms of this treatment plant is 200,000 liters. What, what it means that we are doing just a fifth of what the ball can give us. So the ball will have to rest after working 20% of the day. Chief Executive Officer of Intermec Ghana Limited and owner of the multi-million dollar facility, Eric Johnson, revealed that he has similar facilities dotted across various parts of the world. He spoke about the reason why he's putting up such a facility in a rural setting. No, for the past 25 years, when I started coming home, I saw a lot of things lacking because it was a newly region being created. And then we needed some facilities. I've seen that most of the facilities are lacking over here. And I wonder how people are transferred here, whether they're also feeling things like how the South is. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to you know, put up such facilities, so that to get employment for the youth, and at the same time, improve the social life of the people. The second phase of the project will be an addition of 400 bedrooms to the hotel facility, which is expected to be completed in the next few years. Reporting for the News, Rafik Salam, Graba. Wrap up business for tonight. Many thanks for watching. My name is Imano Abuaji. We have it for more business news updates. Log on to myjoonline.com slash business. Good evening. Welcome back to Joy News Prime. Now, as a solution to the dwindling donor inflows, government is seeking public-private partnerships to improve infrastructure in service provision in the health sector. A five-day forum to foster such relationships got underway in Accra on Monday. Patricia Gasso was there for Joy News. Deputy Minister of Health Tina Mensah told the forum the collaboration between governments and the private sector has become especially critical as a result of the withdrawal of support to the sector. The reduction in donor inflow is justified as these partners shift attention to countries that need more assistance. In light of economic challenges and the burden placed on the national economy by the substantially large wage bill, government has over the years resolved to public-private partnership, PPP, arrangement in healthcare provision. Indeed, government of Ghana funding for goods and services has reduced over the years, and healthcare providers have to find innovative ways to generate revenue, and this include PPP arrangements. I would like to entreat all of us to also consider investing in Preventive services, as it is known fact that non-communicable diseases are rapidly taking over as major causes of morbidity and mortality in Ghana, and indeed many, if not all, West African countries. In developing this strategy, 
framework for public-private partnership in health within the ECOWAS region. Let us take into consideration existing laws and regulations and ensure that these do not unnecessarily impede the harnessing of the full potential of the private sector in the healthcare provision, while at the same time ensuring the higher standard that will be at par with international standard. The mission director for USAID West Africa, Rahel Kripsen, said sustaining enhancement to the health system is equally important, adding that it will help countries achieve their sustainable development goals. She commended the West African Health Organization for establishing the Regional Public-Private Partnership Forum to encourage investors in the health sector in West Africa. Another example is Unilever Foundation's work with its partners, Population Services International, Save the Children and UNICEF during the Ebola outbreak response in Liberia to distribute soap and reach two million people with health education messages. It is our hope that this forum will help establish a broad network of private sector partners with shared interests who will commit resources towards improving the health status of the people of West Africa. Regional public-private partnership in health is a relatively new concept so we think it will require continuous engagement, long-term commitment, transparent communication, and a clearly defined and agreed upon process for realization. WAHO has the political mandate and is well-placed to take public-private partnerships for health in the region to the next level, as well as provide ECOWAS member states with guidance and support to create and sustain their own partnerships. The five-day forum on strategic framework for public-private partnership in health with the ECOWAS region hopes to establish a high-level dialogue platform to enable the public and private sectors to communicate and share ideas for sustainable collaboration in the health sector. Now, First Lady Rebecca Kufado, on her part, is tasking corporate organizations to support the fight against malaria giving a keynote address at the launch of a National Malaria Foundation in Accra on Monday. The First Lady noted, though Ghana has been put on the high pedestal in Africa for effectively fighting malaria, the gains can be eroded, resulting in a resurgence if the funding gap is not bridged, especially as donor funds dwindle. She launched the foundation with an aim of generating support and financial assistance to enable Ghana meet its target of reducing malaria to 0% by 2020. Ghana has made significant progress by reducing malaria deaths by over 60 percent. In fact, today she said it's over 70 percent. This has been possible with the tremendous support of the Ghana government, our health partners, and other organizations working with a common aim to beat malaria. A lot of investment has been made for us to witness this tremendous progress, and we must commend all the actors involved. Me, Chair, ladies and gentlemen. However, we need to sustain the gains and do even more if we have to eliminate malaria. This calls for more and sustained investment. There is a large gap in our funding levels which needs to be filled in order to achieve a malaria-free Ghana. And this is where the business community can lend its support. For the malaria burden is not felt only in the health sector, but in every aspect of our social and economic life. We all know the devastating effect of malaria, not only on the general population, but on businesses. The cost is huge, and businesses can no longer remain indifferent to the fight against malaria. Every business in Ghana has a worker who has suffered malaria before, and knows the cost malaria has on its profitability. This disease affects all businesses, agriculture, banking, manufacturing, hospitality, just to mention a few. This part makes malaria a cause and consequence of low productivity and underdevelopment. I therefore appeal to the corporate world to support this cause. By investing in the fight against malaria, you'll be exercising your power to stop deaths due to malaria. At the same time, your investments will generate real returns as it will be a key driver of business growth. 
Some members of the New Patriotic Party in the Ilokrobo constituency of the Eastern region are protesting what they describe as plans to impose a non indigent on them as due to chief executive. The group is asking President Kufado to be vigilant and listen to the preferred choice of the majority for a DC who is Krobo, or else fate the wrath of the people of the area. Maxwell Kudako filed the following report. <laughs> A group calling itself Concerned Patriots of Yilo Krobo are appealing to the president to appoint a true Yilo Krobo as the chief executive of the municipality. The protesters also allege that Minister of Energy Imano Boache Ejako is influencing the appointment of someone they describe as a stranger as chief executive for the Yilo Krobo municipality. Addressing a press conference at Otekolu on Sunday, the convener of the Concerned Patriots of Hilo Krobo, Emmanuel Ayunyam, said they would resist any attempt to influence the president to impose one Ben Kupualo on them as MCE. He said the people of Hilo Krobo expect one Francis Jeche Apete, the parliamentary candidate of the area during the 2016 elections, to be their MCE. Not that we have less love for Mr. Ben Kupualo, but that we love the choice peace and development of the people of Yilo more. It is instructive to note that the cancer that catapulted the NDC into opposition was the philosophy of let us use them to win election and forget about them. If Honorable Bachi Ajako, the regional chairman, Yilo constituency chairman, and some fraction of Yilo constituency executive want to go by this theory, we believe that Nana Ado, as we know him, will not endorse this unfair political act. The group, however, warned that Krobos will not allow the NPP to take their efforts towards winning the 2016 elections for granted. Some of the protestants spoke to join news. We are natives of Krobo. We are not engaging in tribalism. All we want is that a native of our land be our MC because we believe the person understands us better. Francis Apete is the right man for us. Residents of Ziave Luma, a farming community in the whole municipality of the Volta region, are unhappy about the deplorable state of the access road to the community. Though the 17.5 kilometers Ziavi and Fuerta feeder road was awarded for construction, very little progress has been made on the stretch. The residents lament the slow pace of construction works have worsened their traveling roads and have appealed to government to ensure its, its timely completion to facilitate agribusiness in the area. Fred Kwame Asari filed the following report. Ziavi Lume. Located about 2.5 kilometers away from the Volta Regional Hospital, Ho is a food basket in the municipality, feeding the whole central market directly. However, the route on which foodstuffs are transported to the market center is in a deplorable state. Due to the dusty, bumpy, and pothole ridden nature of the road, commercial vehicles are unwilling to ply the route or charge exorbitant fares when they do. The road was awarded for construction in, in August 2016 to NATO Builders Limited with funding from the road fund, but work has not progressed. At a fundraising debate towards the completion of an information communication technology center for the community basic school, Dufia of Ziavi Lume, Togbe Ajakojo, appealed to the whole municipal assembly and the NPP government to ensure contractors speed up work on the project. Calvet, 
The contractor hasn't made any significant progress since he commenced construction work on the road. Some culverts were constructed, but it is taking forever for the contractor to fill it. Due to this, commercial vehicles have refused to travel the stretch, especially when it rains, with the excuse that the road gets muddy and becomes a more trouble. We are pleading with the government to see to an early completion work on the road. Fred Kwame Osiris report for Joy News. Amir and missionary in charge of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mission in Ghana has added his voice to the call for the disbandment of political vigilante groups in the country. Mobi Mohammed Nur bin Sali noted the existence of the groups in tertiary students' wings of political parties are signs of a retrogressive society. He said the current situation shows a country that is at war with its people. Mobi Nur Mohammed bin Sali made the call at the 55th Annual Regional Conference of the Ahmadiyya Movement in Ghana. Rafiq Salam reports from WA. The 55th Annual Regional Conference of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mission in the Upper West Region was held on the theme, Tolerance and Self-Restraint, a prerequisite for national stability and cohesion. It brought together members of the Ahmadiyya faith from all eight circles in the Upper West Region. Opening the conference, Amir, a missionary in charge of the Ahmadiyya movement in Ghana, Morbi Mohamed Nur bin Sali, expressed concern about the existence of political vigilante groups and student tertiary wings of political parties. He noted that their existence are signs of retrogressive society. Vigilantism is uncalled for in this country. Student unions in the names of political organization is uncalled for in this country. This uh, Delta forces, uh, or are they Madagascar forces, or whatever they are, uh, Azoka boys, and uh, what and what, they are uncalled for. You know, they are only signs of a retrogressive society, a society that is torn. We do apologize for the truncation of that report. Moving on to other stories, or changing your side for and which are for repaying its purchase, the customized Kantanka SUV car at the cost of 150,000 Ghana cities. With the call on Ghanaians to patronize, to patronize made in Ghana products. At a short ceremony to officially hand over the vehicle to the Ochehene at his palace in Chebi, he expressed his excitement about the Kantanka automobile for leading invention in Ghana. Osage Fum, which of repaying, encouraged Kantanka automobile to progress into manufacturing aircraft in Ghana. An invention he believes will put Ghana on the international front. He urged the government to patronize the Kantanka vehicles to promote job creation. Chief Executive of Kantanka Automobile, Kojo Safujina, was grateful to Achehene for purchasing the Kantanka vehicle. He have a call on government to provide some tax holidays for them in order to cut the cost of production and subsequently reduce the prices of their vehicles. He indicated that Kantanka Automobile is negotiating with some banks to provide high purchase services for interested Ghanaians. If the Chinese is able to buy, if he's, if he's been able to buy this Antanka vehicle, I believe it will give a lot of courage to the people who are under him and also other Ghanaians. I mean, this is something that we are doing to boost the confidence of people in the country. So, I mean, the next move is, I mean, next week till the year ends so, or after, we're going to keep pushing. Kantanka will keep pushing to keep convincing people, keep working hard, keep doing things to give people the confidence of you. I mean, we gave one to the police. They've been using it for two years now. It hasn't been any problem. Two and four said to us, got one and got a couple, sorry, and our chain in. So he also says he wants to order for a, a, a handmade customized vehicle like what my father, Apostle Dr. Engineer, just after he's using. So, I mean, we should, the media or Ghanaians should expect more from Tantanka. The only thing I need from the government is if we can adopt the strategy that Nigeria and South Africa uses, whereby
whereby if mobile manufacturers or assemblers get a certain tax waivers and tax holidays. I mean, if somebody, for example, if you buy a Kantanka vehicle, one vehicle, for example, this car that uh, Ochain has been able to purchase, if you buy it, you are feeding the one that did the interior, you are feeding the mechanic, you are feeding the sprayer, you are feeding about 10 to 15 people, all Ghanaians, and the money is still being saved in Ghana. So it's just it's a win-win situation for Kantanka Automobile in Ghana as a whole. of the Coconut Grove Hotel in Accra could have been better contained if it had a firefighting helicopter. PRO of the Ghana Fire Service Prince Billy Anaglati explains the Coconut Grove incident is a typical example of a high inferno that should be tackled from a certain height which could not be reached by the turntable ladder the service has at its disposal. Responding to accusations, firefighters deployed to the scene were helpless and allowed the blaze to affect other properties. Mr. Naglati told Joy News the service has its own challenges. Firefighting is one of the most difficult tasks on earth. When there is fire, people think that the moment the fire service get there, the fire should blow off momentarily. Mm. They think that it is a candle fire that we should get there and blow, you know, uh, uh, wind to it that it goes off. Not that we have not been resourced, you know, uh, but then the fire that we fought on Saturday and any other fires in mm. the market and all that, those fires are best fought with a helicopter. Okay. So you need to fight those fires from a height. Okay. A situation where our turntable ladder that can assist us in fighting fire from a height mm. and to effect rescue from a height can take us only to uh, uh, the sixth floor. Mm. What of the rest of the floors above that? Mm. So this fire could have also be burst forth uh, with a helicopter. All right. But we do not we have do it. Not have but that is wrong to say that that might have caused the situation that we are talking of now. The strategy used by the firefighters on the day has also been questioned, but the fire service spokesperson says the criticisms are misplaced. Firefighting is no longer the massive application of water. If we are not careful, you, the water damage will even be more than the, 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 the distraction from the fire itself. What's what we happened? did was to position five tenders permanently on, on, on the ground to continue having effective firefighting mm. on the facility that was, that was on fire. Mm. And then they should also ensure that there was no spread of fire to other adjoining mm. facilities. But the rest of the, 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 the appliances should go and bring water because there was no way we could rely on any hydrant, ready hydrant there for uninterrupted water supply. So what we were doing is to allow the rest to pick water and come and drop it and move out. Mm -hmm. But the public, you know, staying outside, looking at vehicles moving in and moving out. They couldn't Yeah, understand. they only concluded that we, we got in empty tender mm -hmm. and look at the fire mm -hmm. and then move on. Mm -hmm. oh, are, we, are, we, are, we, are we not having a single white person in fire service mm -hmm. uh, to say that it is wrong for us not to fill the tanker, let alone when you are called before you get in there, mm -hmm. look at the fire and go. It mm -hmm. is totally wrong. It's false. Mm -hmm. It's not true. is Joy News Prime.